Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. It's a wonderful Friday morning and you are welcome once again to Living in the Digital World program series. My name is Florence Tofa and I'm presenting from American Corner Agboba, and I will be your moderator for today. Today, it's a very interesting session. And as we all know, American Spaces provides access to current and reliable information about the United States. And we are doing this at the American Corner through book collection, internet access, events, and activities for everyone. And this event is one of the activities of the American Spaces. Today, we are going to discuss a very important topic, and I'm particularly interested in this topic because most of us really do not pay attention to what we share and how we actively participate in other discussions when it comes to laws regarding misinformation and disinformation. So today, we are going to discuss what are the actual laws regarding misinformation and disinformation. Facilitating this session is an expert, Efo Kokumauto. He is the managing director of EKM Communications Consulting of Direct Institute of Directors Ghana. FO is the serious and multi-skilled young African person. He is passionate and very optimistic about the innate ability of the African people to rise above the storm to make hay even when the sun is out. Efo is a public relations enthusiast. He has worked in various technical roles in different organizations. In 2018, he was a personal assistant to the CEO at Efo Men's and Consulting, working from the premium office in Accra. He was also a project executive, planning and executing the Torchbearers Network and the Speakers Bureau Africa. He has BA in Communication Studies and holds a Master's Institute of Journalism, where he is currently pursuing a Master's Program in Journalism. He vision, his vision is to avail his experience as he's doing today, knowledge expertise to facilitate and promote any project, program, or organizations that he works with. And during this session, please type all your comments, questions, and it's over to Efo. Efo, take us through what you have for us today, the laws regarding misinformation, disinformation, and our viewers are patiently waiting. Hello, good morning from Ghana, and good afternoon, good evening from wherever that you are joining us from. My name is Efo Koku Mawuto. Uh, I am Ghanaian. I've not been outside Ghana before, so it is pride for me to have such an opportunity to be on uh, this platform, having a conversation about legalities, digital wave, and what uh, information has to do with disinformation, misinformation in the country. My journey to this, this place, uh, I think started in 2018, I was in a level 200 in undergrad and I had a course called Media and Society and the lecturer who took that course, uh, kudos to him, told us about media literacy and I got interested. And so I started learning beyond the classroom about media literacy, what it means, what we can do about it and all of that. Now, in, as time went on, I began to read more about the field and realized that there was more to media literacy than just knowing how to protect yourself online and all the principles and tools that were available. But it's also about legalities because we cannot discuss media literacy uh, without discussing the legal frameworks or the regulatory uh, frameworks that regard the space of media literacy. So I have taken my time to go through some of the country's legal documents regarding communication, information, broadcasting, because I was in a journalism school. I did my undergrad and master's studies. 
both in journalism. So then we began to access and understand the space. And we realized that, well, there are laws that can be used, if you so wish, to prosecute a person who shares something that is found to be a misinformation or a disinformation. So today, my our discussion is going to take a very simple trend. Um, we're going to talk about two basic laws uh, that in the space of media in Ghana, we believe these two laws can be called the twin devils, if you so wish. Now, these two laws, the first of them being the Electronic Communications Act, and the second being the Criminal Offense and Offenses Act, Criminal and Offenses Act. The ECA, Electronic Communications Act, was enacted way back in 2008. And then in, as for the Criminal and Offenses Act, it's one of the, uh, the section we are going to deal with, that is section 208, has been with us since the criminal code days. So since the days of the criminal code, we've always had the Criminal and Offenses Act. And so these two are going to be my major focus for this discussion. Later in the discussion, if time permits, we'll talk about the Data Protection Act, as well as the right to information law and some other issues that may rise out of it. So let's go straight in. In the course of the discussion, if you have any questions, please drop the questions in the comment section and we will get the question we will answer it as best as we can or find the right information for you. Okay, so legal frameworks in Ghana regarding misinformation and disinformation. I ask the question, in Ghana, can you be arrested for sharing or creating and sharing misinformation and disinformation? And the answer is yes, you can be arrested you can be prosecuted and you can be jailed or fined if you shared something that is found out to be a misinformation or a disinformation. Though so far, these two laws have not been applied to individuals, say, on who shared stuff on WhatsApp or who shared stuff on Facebook or who shared stuff on Twitter or any other social media platform yet. It has been used to arrest people who operate in the online space. And so it can be applied to any regular individual, any regular citizen who shares misinformation or disinformation. Now, the first of these laws is the Electronic Communications Act, as I mentioned, uh, promulgated and enacted in 2008 by the then government, the then parliament, and in Ghana, it's called the Act 755. In this act, sections 75 and 76 address directly what the what address directly the issues regarding misinformation and disinformation. And just quickly, I'm going to lower my uh, stop sharing my screen for now so that I can read verbatim what the law says for all of us to hear. Uh, now, according to this Criminal uh, Electronic Communications Act 2008, Act 775, Section 75 says, and I quote, a person who knowingly transmits or circulates false or deceptive distress safety or identification signals commit an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of not more than 3,000 penalty units or to a term of imprisonment of not more than five years or both. Now, the 76, section 76 is subtitled false communications and it says, a person who by means of electronic communications service knowingly sends a communication 
which is false or misleading or likely to prejudice the efficiency of life-saving service or to endanger the safety of any person, ship, aircraft, vessel, or vehicle commits an offense and is liable on summary conviction to a fine of not more than 3,000 penalty units or to a term of imprisonment of not more than five years or both. It goes further to say, a person is taken to know that a communication is false or misleading if that person did not take the reasonable steps to find out whether the communication was false, misleading, reckless, or fraudulent. Now, the third part of this section says, subsection two, which is knowing by, because you did not do the, the necessary checks. Subsection two does not apply to the operator or provider of a network or service over which a communication is sent. Now, what this simply means is that first and foremost, it's about signals. So even if you share something that is assumed to be false or that causes distress, for instance, in COVID-19 uh, in 2020, some people shared information on social media that uh, sought to push different forms of uh, conspiracy theories about the origin of the, of the disease, about the, the fundus of the disease, about uh, some issues of the disease being made in a lab and created to kill Africans or uh, wipe us off the face of the earth. All of these were shared. Others shared information about remedies, cures. Some people said they had cures. Some people said they had treatment. Some people said if you drank a lot of hot pepper solution, it could cure the disease. Some people said if you drank uh, more alcohol. And in Ghana, we have a special alcohol that can be, it's, it's called spirit elsewhere, but here it's, it's alcohol that is consumed. And the, the local name is Akpeteshi, right? Akpeteshi in, in, in Ghana. And some people said if you took or consume this alcohol, you would be able to cure or kill the viruses in your system if you contracted coronavirus, or you would be able to uh, sort of indemnify or insure yourself from con contracting coronavirus. Now, all of these caused a lot of distress to people. It caused confusion. People didn't know what to do. People didn't know what to believe anymore. And so the government, or the security services could have swooped in and using the section 75 of the Electronic Communications Act, arrest people who were propagating such information. Now in propagating such information, it also includes people who shared. So you may not be the creator of the information, but if you shared such an information and section 76 addresses that and says that if, you shared such an information knowing that it was false or it could be false. And that's the interesting part. You may not know that it was false, but even if you had the inkling, if you had the, 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 the mere thought, so in court, you will be asked, did you consider that it could be false? And if you did say, yes, I thought it might be, but I also thought it was true, then you could be arrested and prosecuted and maybe go to jail for five years or be fined or be fined and jailed at the same time, depending on what the, the, the arresting officer and the prosecutors think is the severity of the situation. So, what is even interesting for me about the section 76 is the clause two, which says that you are assumed to know that an information is false or misleading before sharing 
if you did not take the precaution of finding out, and that's where the problem is, because as young people, as people in the space, or, or as netizens, I should say, we are likely to just forward. We are likely to, to not abide by the, the, the mantra in, in the digital literacy world of pause, reflect before you share. And we just share because we are received. Most of the time we share because we are tense, we share because we are nervous, we share because uh, we think it's true. Some of us share because we just share everything that comes onto our platforms, right? And on top of that, even if some of us may not share, some of us don't educate our parents or the aged or people in our relations or our groups to not share. So some of us even claim we are sharing because we want to prevent other people from sharing it. I mean, as much as there is a lot of uh, clean thought, so to speak, in, in that action, it is still considered sharing, okay? So you can actually be arrested for that. And you are assumed to know. You are assumed to be aware of the truth or otherwise of the information you share if you did not take the precaution to find out whether it was false. And so that's where the problem is. So if you, if you are sharing any information, know that the Electronic Communications Act can be used against you if you did not do the due diligence of fact-checking or cross-checking or verifying this information before you shared it. Now, the Electronic Communications Act, Section 76, Clause 3, goes on to say that even when you are arrested, the network on which you shared is not liable. So if you shared on Facebook, Facebook cannot be arrested. You cannot say as a defense in court that, oh, I have just 5,000 uh, followers, or I have just, maybe I have just 200 uh, friends on Facebook. So it, it, it couldn't have gone wild if Facebook didn't have um, five, what, 2 billion, 3 billion subscribers or users. Or you cannot say that it is MTN Ghana that provided me the, the internet access to be able to share this. What it simply means is that if you are arrested and you are prosecuted on the basis of the Electronic Communications Act, Section 76, you don't have any defense in bringing other people in. You are arrested and arrested and prosecuted alone. It means that you cannot be, you cannot be, you, you cannot be, how do I even put this? You cannot, in legal language, we say you cannot be prosecuted severally, which means that you cannot be prosecuted in tandem with other, other people who provided you a platform on which you share the item. It will be assumed that you have the platform and you used it for what you wanted. Like we say in media literacy parlance, if the gun as a, a weapon is, 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 is powerless unless somebody uses it. So the gun in itself cannot kill unless somebody uses it to kill because the same gun is used to kill, uh, to hunt. And if somebody chooses to use a hunting gun to kill a human being, that person who uses a hunting gun to kill a human being would be arrested and prosecuted on the basis of murder or manslaughter at best. But somebody else can use the same gun to, to hunt and would not be prosecuted because the purpose for which the, the item is used is what is considered in the law. It is not the item in itself. So Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Telegram, all these platforms cannot be prosecuted for what an individual on their platform shares, but the individual can be prosecuted on the basis of the Electronic Communications Act 775, 
section 76. So that is for the Electronic Communications Act. This has been used since 2008, and a number of people have been arrested and prosecuted in Ghana. In, in, in a short while, I'll go into the, some of the key examples and some of the most recent examples of, of same. Now, in the, to, moving on to the second law. The second law is the Criminal and Offenses Act. And as I said, this Criminal and Offenses Act emanates from the Criminal Code, and it is specifically Section 208 that has something to do with false information and misleading information. And if you permit me, I'll stop sharing for just a brief moment so that I can read the, the act, the section verbatim from the law itself. Now in the law, it says, and I quote, this is Criminal and Offenses Act section 28. It reads, a person who publishes or reproduces a statement, and this is the critical part, a person who publishes or reproduces a statement, a rumor, or a report, which is likely to cause fear and alarm to the public or to disturb the public peace, knowing or having reason to believe that the statement, rumor, or report is false, commits a misdemeanor, and is liable on summary conviction, conviction to three years imprisonment. Let me read it again. Section 208 of the Criminal and Offenses Act, which was enacted in 1960, as I said, this is part of the criminal code, way back in 1960, says, a person who publishes or reproduces a statement, rumor, or report, which is likely to cause fear and alarm, to harm the public, or to disturb the public peace, knowing or having reason to believe that the statement, rumor, or report is false and commits a misdemeanor and is liable on summary conviction to three years imprisonment. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a critical part of the laws regarding misinformation, disinformation in Ghana. Criminal and Offenses Act, way back in 1960, this law was promulgated and it has been in session till today. It is being used to arrest people who often the government or the political apparatus believes have propagated information which is false or misleading or is likely to cause fear and panic, right? Now, the interesting thing to note is that the law says, if you knew or you had reason to believe the information would cause fear and panic or would alarm the public or disturb the public peace, you are liable on summary conviction to three years imprisonment. In the uh, Electronic Communications Act, the term of imprisonment is not less than five years. In this uh, Criminal and Offenses Act, it is three years imprisonment. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not something to joke with because there have been arrests from as far back as the 1960s, and there have been recent arrests, which we will get into in a jiffy. But what you need to understand is that this hampers on something in Ghana or in, 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 in legal parlance we call threat to national security. Now, in fact, a gentleman, I think in 2020 or so, was murdered because of his activities online and the murder is purported to have been instigated by a politician in, the, in his community. And that murder led to a huge confrontation between the youth of the community and a task force of the police and military which were sent to that community. I'll get into that story in a jiffy, but 
I just want us to understand the severity of this law and that it can be used to arrest any regular person. So long as somebody feels that the information you have shared is possibly can affect or can disturb the peace of the nation or of the public, that person can cause you to be arrested and prosecuted. And often, often it is the government or it is the state apparatus like the police or like the military, or, yes, who often would come, or the national security in, in, in times past, it has been the national security at the forefront of some of these arrests. And so people, we have to be weary. Now, what is interesting about the Criminal and Offenses Act, what is critical about the Criminal and Offenses Act for me is that it is not only about the publisher of the information, but anybody who reproduces it. Now, reproduction, according to the, the, the arrest and prosecution so far, reproduction, though not explicit in the law, the Criminal and Offenses Act itself, means or includes sharing. Just by sharing the information, you are considered to have reproduced it. So I may have shared something on my Facebook wall. If you did not do the due diligence to investigate the, the, the truth of it, and you just shared it, you have reproduced it. And because you have reproduced it, you can be arrested and prosecuted under the Criminal and Offenses Act 1960. If the statement can even be just a rumor. Ladies and gentlemen, this is serious. Even if it turns out that this is just a rumor, this, the people are sharing, people are talking about something in your office or on your campus or at your workplace, or people are talking about something you heard in a car, in, in, a, in a public transport you, you, you took to somewhere and you heard people talking about something and you just posted that on your Facebook wall, you are considered to have published some information that is liable to cause, to disturb the, the, the peace or cause fear and panic. Just rumor. Otherwise, it can be a full report, like a journalistic report put out, which is considered to be, have the ability or likely disturb the, the, the peace of the, of, of the community or cause fear and panic among people. You can't be arrested. And so, as we go about our daily routine and as we want to be the first to share, these days as netizens, we are not only sharers or consumers of information, we are also producers of information. And so as we go about our daily routine and we realize uh, that we can, we get information that we feel this information is coming from a source, I believe. That's a problem. Most of the time, it is because we think the person talking about the issue is to be trusted. But the person may also be speaking from by because they heard it from somewhere else. And that could cause you to be arrested and prosecuted under the Criminal and Offenses Act. Again, again, if the information you shared has, you see, that the problem is that it is the arresting officers and the prosecutors who are going to determine whether that information can cause fear and panic or disturb public peace. It is not you. It is not your lawyer. The determination, and that is, that is one of the problems that uh, over the years, those of us in the, in the media advocacy or media freedom advocacy have put out so that it, it leaves a lot of room. It leaves a lot of room for the arresting officers to, to to, as it were, uh, how do I even put it? To determine, to be the determinant of whatever they think is the, of whatever they think is, is, is the reason why they are arresting you. So this, the arresting officers can be the ones to determine whether what you shared or what you published was, uh, had the likelihood to cause fear and panic or had the likelihood to cause, uh, to disturb public peace. So 
we are to be careful. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, these are the two major laws that have been used over the years to arrest and prosecute people for sharing misinformation or disinformation. But they are not the only laws regarding the space of information in Ghana. In Ghana, we have a law called the Data Protection Act, quite recently uh, promulgated. Now, the Data Protection Act is supposed to help the individual protect their data. What it means also is that if you shared somebody's data, which the person did not give you express permission to share, you could be arrested and prosecuted. And in that same Data Protection Act, there are exemptions under the, 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 the section on national protection of national security or threat to national security, there are exemptions. And if you shared any information that is, so is seen to have flouted any of these exemptions, exemptions including people's medical records. So if you found somebody's medical record and you took a picture of it and said, I have your medical records, it's, in, it's with me. If you like, if you want, come for it. People do that. Like I have seen posts on Facebook, I have seen posts on Twitter, especially where people say, um, I found this, how do you call it, ID card in a car. If it's yours, come for it. Yes, that is good. But the information behind the ID card says, if found, take to the police or the appropriate authorities. It didn't say share on social media. So if you share that on social media, the individual could sue you for sharing their private information online because the data you have shared, the ID card has the person's date of birth and maybe the person doesn't want their date of birth out there. You could share, fine, maybe you went to buy in Ghana, you could go to the, the wayside roasted plantain seller or vendor and buy roasted plantain. And the paper that is used to wrap this roasted plantain is somebody's medical records or somebody's uh, uh, exams result. And you, in, 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 in trying to create fun and comedy, you would share this. If you did share this, the person involved, if they wanted to take you on, they could use a Data Protection Act to take you on. And they will sue you and you will be made to pay huge fines. And even under the Data Protection Act, you could be in prison for three years, for seven years, depending on the severity of the, the matter that you, the person sued you for, depending on the, what the person is seeking the court to do, the damages the person is claiming. Right? So under the Data Protection Act, Act 2012, and, and I'm not even reading quotes because there are various sections. The generality of the Data Protection Act is supposed to protect individuals' data, so much so that it, it institutes something called the uh, data processors. Now, a data processor is an organization or an individual who collate individuals' data. So if you work in an office and you work with people's data, you send out Google Forms all the time asking people to fill those forms, well, you are a data processor. The first thing is that you're supposed to, as an organization, register with the Data Protection Agency, Data Protection Commission, rather, the Data Protection Commission as a data processor. Now, as you register as a data processor, whenever you're about to process people's private or personal data, the, the data protection act calls it personal data. If you were sharing such, processing such a thing, you were expected to alert the individual, right? Now, in all these, if you found such information and you just put it out on social media from your organization, you and your organization can be sued individually and severally for sharing somebody. And if you were on social media and you also share that information, just broadcasted it to your other platforms or shared it on your wall, even though you are not the originator, the publisher of the information, you can also be liable under the Data Protection Act. Now, there is another law called the Right to Information Law, very recently promulgated in 2019. And this Right to Information Law gives access 
to information. So if I'm a journalist or if I'm a reporter or I'm a researcher or I'm just a regular Ghanaian and I need certain information, I can invoke the right information law and get that information from an organization. But the right information law also insists that you cannot share such information unless you have sought the permission of the individuals involved. So yes, you have, um, as a researcher or as an individual, you, you wanted some information. So you went to the, to the Ministry of Health and you asked for uh, a list of people who had COVID-19 because you are working on something, a research paper, and you wanted that information. And you got that information, you cannot share that information. If you shared it, even though you have the right to that information, you don't have the right to share. Sorry, guys, uh, I'm in the office, so there is some amount of activity here. Please forgive me. Okay. Okay, thank you. The, the, the noise is gone far from me now. Okay, so as I was saying, right to information, even though you have the right to the information, you do not have the right to share the information without the express permission of the, the, the person who involved or the persons involved. So somebody whose information you have in, in gotten or access by invoking the right to information can sue you under the Data Protection Act for sharing their information. And you could be jailed or you could be fined a hefty fine. In fact, some people have been fined. And I, I personally have reported some issues to the Data Protection Commission. I did that in 2020. And as, as of January this year, I know that the, the issues are being processed. And the, the interesting thing about the Data Protection Commission and the Data Protection Act is that the Data Protection Commission has been giving, under this law, the right to prosecute. So it is not now that the police is going to come in. The Data Protection can prosecute you directly. And the, interest, the extra interesting thing about the Data Protection Act and the commission is that there is a special court set aside by the law to prosecute cases. So you're not going to be walked through the... Uh, the regular legal system, go to court for a whole year and maybe the case we made a foolish case. Or, no, 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 no. You will be dealt with properly. If, you, if somebody sued you under the Data Protection Act, you will be dealt with because the court, the law allows for the, the, the commission to first of all form itself into a legal entity and sue you and prosecute you as such. So for me, even the Data Protection Act is more serious to us as individuals, because we share information, excuse me to say, haphazardly. We share information, excuse me to say, indiscriminately. And so if you share my information and I think that I can, I can make some money out of you, I will sue you. And you don't have to, I don't have to suffer going through the legal system, find a lawyer and all of those things. I just have to take you to the Data Protection Commission and they will form themselves into a legal entity and prosecute you. And whatever judgment or ruling they give is liable and accepted by even the, uh, uh, the highest, the apex court of the land. So the Data Protection Act for me is very, and that is why I added it to these. So even though it is not like a criminal law, like the Electronic Communications Act and the Criminal and Offenses Act, it is as serious and maybe more serious because it is the simplest that can be used by anybody at all to cause you to be arrested and prosecuted for sharing information about them. And it includes not only publishers of information, it includes transmitters or broadcasters of information as well. And now, let's now go to some of the recent arrests that have been made. There have been many. In fact, if you read online, you'll find between 2021 and 2022, there have been almost more than 20 arrests that were made. Um, and, and even the, the Reporters Without Borders considered the number of arrests and uh, that counted in Ghana's ranking, poor ranking actually, on the Media Freedom Index last year by the, the Reporters Without Borders. So, but the, I want to talk about three major ones. Now, in 2019, 
right before the COVID. In fact, very late in 2019, two reporters and the chief editor for Modern Ghana, an online news platform in Ghana, were arrested, detained for days, way beyond the, the 48 hour prosecution the deadline that is given by the constitution. And we didn't, nobody knew their whereabouts. Nobody knew what happened to them. They came out and shared part, bits and pieces of their story, but they were arrested by the, oh, let me say they were picked up by the national security in 2019. And what did they do? They were accused of publishing information that was likely to threaten the peace of the country. And that offense is captured in the Criminal and Offenses Act. And these are bloggers who think that the blogging space is unregulated. Now, the interesting thing is that we are told that had they been prosecuted in court, people who shared the link to that story would have been liable. If not for the fact that advocacy from people, uh, entities like Media Foundation for West Africa and other uh, individuals in the space of media freedom advocacy were very strong at the time, they would have been prosecuted. And were they prosecuted, people who shared the link to that particular story for which they were picked up would have also been picked up as well or would have been punished in, in some ways. And being national security, they claim that they had a list of people who shared. Even if they didn't have your real names, they had your social media handles. They would have found a way to get you arrested. So that was in 2019. In 2020, the president issued an emergency executive instrument that allowed the president to have access to all incoming and outgoing communications in the country. A lot of people didn't hear of this. There was a fresh executive instrument in 2020 in the name of COVID. That instrument was, was, was uh, uh, how do I even put it? Was, was signed, I should say, by the president. And it, it insisted that even telecommunications networks had to provide a list of incoming and outgoing information to the president. And based on that, people could be arrested. In fact, if you remember in 2020, aside from COVID, we had this issue of secessionists who were arrested. We also had the issue of people uh, who were purported to have been planning a coup. If you remember, those of us who follow the, the, the news, political news in Ghana would remember this. All these arrests were made because of the allowance of this executive instrument on the back of the Criminal and Offenses Act. On top of that, in 2021, reporters and editors of WhatsApp News, another digital news platform, they, WhatsApp News, what they do is that they publish news like newspaper, but they don't print. They publish digitally they were also arrested and they were supposed to have shared information about the presidency which was not which was not true or was reported to be false or misleading and this happened in 2021 just a year after uh, the height of covid in ghana and And as part of, of that, the editors and the reporters were arrested. It was interesting. Once again, it took advocacy to get these people released. They were almost prosecuted, but advocacy ensured that they were not prosecuted. But the interesting thing to note is that the Electronic, uh, the Criminal and Offenses Act, once again, was invoked here. And it was on that basis of threat to national security and disturbance of national peace uh, or uh, public peace that these reporters were arrested. And these are digital journalists. 
they are mobile journalists. They do all their publications online, especially on WhatsApp. And they, they have blogs that they publish their items on. And that's another example of how the Criminal and Offenses Act was used. Now in 2022, a broadcaster from Accra FM was arrested by the national security and the police. Oh no, this time by the police, not by the national security. Uh, very sorry, there is some noise in the background. Let me wait a few seconds when the noise passes. Whilst we are waiting for our facilitator, you can still post questions. There are already some interesting questions online. And this is coming from Kwesi Fiaco, and he is asking, how are these laws affecting the practice of journalism in Ghana, particularly the investigative journalism? And he's interested to know how these laws affect journalism in Ghana. I'm sure it will be an interesting discussion. I'm sure the noise is but we can get back online. Definitely, definitely. I, I, it's a lovely question because myself, I started my practice as an investigative journalist, but um, I think I'll put that on hold for now. And it's definitely because of some of these uh, very interesting laws that can be used to hamper the progress of the work. Uh, but then let me quickly talk about the Accra FM incident, and then we can go into the questions. Now, Accra FM, this time it was a broadcaster on radio. Interestingly, he wasn't arrested for his broadcasting on radio. He was arrested for posting a video that purported that the wife of the vice president, the wife of the vice president, had bought some land uh, with state money. And whether this news was true or not, this gentleman we're talking about, whose name I don't want to mention for because I don't have his permission to mention his name. But the story is out there, so we can all read about this online. Now, this gentleman... He is seen to be one of the very strong voices when it comes to uh, investigative morning shows. So he, is, he has or he put out information that is expected or considered to be facts about various politicians and what they are doing with state money or what they are doing with their offices. And so he had this information, but he wasn't arrested because he put this out online. He was arrested because he put it, he wasn't arrested because he put this out on radio. He was arrested because he put this out online. And it was the Electronic Communications Act that was used to arrest him, right? And so he was detained for, I think, 24 hours or 48 hours. And later released, we heard he was being prosecuted, but as of now, I don't know what has become of the case, but I know he's, he's still in practice now. But point being, all the people who shared that information, if he is prosecuted, will be brought in at the very least as witnesses. At the very least, they will be brought in as witnesses to the prosecution's case. And if you are brought in as a witness, not only will it disturb your personal daily routine, your name goes into the law book as a witness, right? On top of that, if the prosecution is, is, is wants to go wild, they can actually, using the Electronic Communications Act, to arrest every individual who share that information. And you see the interesting thing about the Electronic Communications Act, it does not matter whether you knew the information was false or not. As long as you didn't do the due diligence of finding out, you are liable. So that is one of the examples where the Electronic Communications Act was used. Uh, as for the examples of Data Protection Act, because of data protection, I cannot mention those examples because most of the examples I have are privileged information. They are not information I have that are online. But then I know for a fact that people, especially fines, a lot of people have been fined for sharing information on WhatsApp, as in WhatsApp platform, uh, uh, the same WhatsApp messenger we all use. I know for a fact through my privileged sources that a lot of people have been fined for sharing items on WhatsApp that people felt were a, 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 were a breach of their privacy or a breach of their, their data protection rights. So these issues are real. If it has not yet affected you, it might affect you soon. How many of us remember Shatawale and medical 
they are they were arrested i think in 2020 2020 or 2021 or so they were arrested and detained for a while and their cases were prosecuted in court because they brandished gun or they talked about some issues on 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 twitter or on their instagram live or something like that that was the electronic uh, the uh, how do you call it criminal and offenses act in in, in practice straight away the police use that law to arrest these two gentlemen right and in talking about the severity of their action you see the truth about online and sharing of misinformation is that if the publisher publishes and no one shares the information has no impact so for the police or for the prosecution the impact of the story or the impact of the, the publication is determined by the number of shares or engagement. And that's what they will use to determine whether the information, the person should be, the, the severity of the punishment the person would get. So if we are sharing, we should know that not, even though we may not be arrested, we are causing somebody else to be arrested. And that is for me critical. Every digital literate or media literate must understand that personally, you may not be arrested for sharing, even though the Data Protection Act can be used to fine you or jail you. Using the Electronic Communications Act and the Criminal and Offenses Act, you as an individual, if you're not a publisher, on the scale of 100, 70, 80%, you will not be arrested. But in few cases, if the person wants you arrested, they will get you arrested. But as you share, know that you are contributing to the likelihood of somebody being arrested. So if somebody is arrested because of something they published online, know that it is because you shared it or people shared that information. And that was the only reason why the arrest happened. Because if somebody shared, published an information and nobody shared, there were no retweets on Twitter, there were no shares on Facebook, LinkedIn, there were not uh, any comments on Instagram, it will not trend. If it doesn't trend, people don't care. But as long as it trends, people care. And there can be arrest, there can be prosecution, there can be punishment in terms of jail or in terms of uh, fines. And so these are the laws regarding okay. misinformation and disinformation in Ghana. Beautiful laws and uh, other things that are happening around the electronic communication and data protection at. But uh, mm. I mean, Kwesi Fianco's question, you, yeah. you didn't answer the question. And also another okay. question is, if this is the case, why, mm. Is it that we don't have a lot of uh, uh, advocacy around these laws to educate people? We don't have a lot of like uh, a lot of mechanism put in place to ensure that people are educated about these laws for them to know what they are up against. Mm -hmm. So let me start with uh, Mr. Fianco's question: Investigative journalism in this in the face of these laws, especially the the electronic communications act as well as the criminal and offenses act truth be told uh, most of the investigative journalists in ghana now are weary i can tell you that for a fact in fact i did a story last year on the state of investigative journalism in ghana i i had this interview with one of the ace investigative journalists manasse azuri and he confessed that he can literally count on one hand the number of investigative journalists left in the country. And it's a worrying trend because see, investigative journalism is very critical to, to proof, proof, proofing our democracy. And to that extent, to ensuring that we call the powers that be to order in terms of how they use or dissipate our national resources. So um, a lot of people, in fact, in court right now, in court right now, the case between Kwesinya Techi and Tiger IPI and Anas Arimiya Anas is hinging on the issue of one, uh, the Criminal and Offenses Act, and two, defamation. 
You get it. So yes. Christian Yantachi is claiming defamation, and Christian Yantachi's lawyers are claiming that the issue, uh, as published, could have damaged the, the 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 public peace, could have caused riot, and and that is the only reason why we still have this issue in court. Otherwise, we all saw evidence, and we all felt that per the evidence shown, visual evidence given to all of us, the matter should have been a straight arrest prosecution of the person accused in the film. Sorry, there's some noise in my background. Okay, gone down now. So that is how much these laws are affecting investigative journalism in Ghana. I know for sure that, um, and this is, I, th I don't even think this is grapevine. If you look at the trends, okay, Manasseh Azuri left the, uh, how do you call it, media, uh, multimedia group, right after publishing the story on the uh, vigilante groups supposedly working at the castle or training at, at, in front of the president's house, like training at, like the president being aware of the presence of these vigilante groups and being part of it and all of that, okay? What happened? There was a case made by the national security. And I think there was a threat or actual, I don't remember the story clearly, but either a threat or an actual prosecution. Uh, big bosses, big bosses. Hello, Pacho, they were online being to Oh, Okay, so so please, uh -huh. so we are just wrapping up. Yeah. Okay. So as I said, this this issue, um, he, after he published the story about the vigilante group and their operations, there was either a threat or uh, an actual prosecution of multimedia group. And we know that multimedia group uh, beseeched Manasseh to drop the story or to, to pull it down and in, in, in refusal, he left. You understand me? So that there are, there are issues that I have heard that I cannot share because of uh, privacy and all of that. But I can tell you for a fact, these laws have been used to hamper investigative journalism in Ghana. And over the years, there are many investigative journalists who have moved to PR journalism and have started doing, he said, she said, because they want peace of mind. They don't want trouble. In fact, in my, uh, uh, when we were finishing undergraduates uh, in GIJ, Ghana Institute of Journalism, I was probably the only student who was doing active investigative journalism. <laughs> No other person was doing. And my friends would say, me, I don't want trouble. I want to do my journalism in peace, right? In my master's, when I was I finished my master's in my class, I was the only student who was interested in investigative journalism. Even though we took a course in investigative and advanced reporting, I was the only one who was interested. And all these because of the fear of reprisals, the fear of these laws being used against the journalists. So yes, it is affecting us negatively. And that is why as a... Uh, Madam Florence said, we need advocacy. There has been some advocacy though. There has been advocacy uh, on from people like, in fact, this is advocacy. Um, Mobile Web and American uh, Embassy together, uh, this is a pure education of the public about some of the presence of some of these laws. So I would say that advocacy in the space is being done. I know Pen Plus Byte has also done quite an amount of work on the Electronic Communications Act, especially, and they have engaged parliament, they have engaged different stakeholders on the matter. But we need a lot more advocacy, not only towards the powers that be to, um, how do you call it, to, 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 to use a common word to edit the law or to use a legal word to amend the laws, but also advocacy to educate the public of the presence of these laws so that they are weary or they are careful of what they publish, what they share and what they broadcast so that they are not uh, caught off guard when some of these issues arise. That's it for me. If there are any questions, I would take them and answer them. Yes, I asked the question, why if, if we know that uh, all these laws are important, why is it that we are not actively advocating for it and educating people about this law? Yes, I think your, your network broke off a little bit, but I, I said that, yes, we there is some work being done. And I mentioned that this particular session, 
by Mobile Web Ghana and American Embassy and your partners. This is one of the wonderful works that is being done. In fact, in researching this uh, topic, when I called my people, my, my contact, some of them said, hey, Ethel, we don't have anything in Ghana like that too, because people don't even know that these laws exist. Or people don't know. Some of the people know the law exists. They don't know how it can be applied on them. So it's there, there is some education being done, and I commend Mobile Web Ghana for this session. I know that Pen Plus Byte has also done some work on the Electronic Communications Act. I know there have been some stakeholder engagement about amending the law, and there has been some engagement with the youth, with young people, training them on how to blog, how to write, and still avoid the, some of these laws being used on them. But then, I agree with you, Madam Florence, we need to do way more than we have done. We need to educate people, like the writers who are on this call, who are listening to me, write about these laws. The, if you are a blog, you have your social media platforms, post on the blogs, post on your Facebook, on your Twitter. Did you know that electronic communications act exists and can be used to arrest and prosecute you for just sharing information? Did you know that somebody can arrest, can, can cause you to be arrested for sharing data if they felt you shared their data and they didn't give you permission? Some of these will go a long way to spread the word about these laws and how they can be applied to arrest and prosecute and penalize, if you so wish, uh, netizens for sharing information online. Thank you, Efo, and this brings us to the end. I think uh, Florence is having a few challenges. Challenges with the uh, but, uh, Yes, but I'm, I'm definitely sure that she's going to join us. She's going to return to us. Fortunately, uh, we don't have much time on her mm. side because... Uh, I, I am here. here with us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so please, we want to end this program and I want to invite you to subscribe to the eLibrary USA. eLibrary USA is available in all American spaces in the world and you can put your comments if you want to request for the access to the eLibrary USA, please do that via the comment box. And usually this resource is always available for free. Please join us. And this brings us to the end of this program. It was brought to you by the US Embassy, American Connect Buba in partnership with Mobile Web Ghana. And that concludes our program for today. Thank you very much. Subscribe to further programs that will be bringing you your way at YouTube, on YouTube at US Embassy Ghana for more amazing virtual programs. Thank you very much. Stay safe until we meet next time. Bye.